risk that you lead your nations into territory that may seem overwhelming but is actually the only way out. The coming days will offer ample risk of being blindsided by animosity, difficulty, complexity or downright fear. Please bear that in mind. Please dig deep in yourself and find the power to reconcile, to overcome, to understand and to dare. Intensive and honest dialogue is required. Or as Winston Churchill once said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak, but courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. And we must do both this week. We must simply do better and be better than ever before. I ask that you collect all your patience, find all of your compassion, remember all the happy compromises of your lives, and muster all your courage and determination. We invite all leaders of the world to adopt a deal that, that will affect all aspects of society, just as the change in climate does. A deal that includes decision in both negoti negotiating uh, tracks, a deal that matters, a deal that changes the future and creates a better one. Because generations to come are depending on us. Please remember that we have faced global threats and challenges before. We have dealt with them. We have overcome them. So the good new news is we know what the problem is and we know how to solve it, so to, to speak. We have to change. That is the clear message from science. And we can change. That is the clear message from technology. And we want to change. That is the very clear message, not only from the people in the streets in Copenhagen, but from people from around the entire world. I sincerely hope that you have come here with a clear message to the people of the world, that we, their leaders, will change. In the words of the African-American writer Maya Angelou, Nothing will work unless you do. Excellences, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a warm and heartfelt welcome to Copenhagen. We are thrilled to have you here because Copenhagen is the place to be and Copenhagen is the place to act. So now let us roll up our sleeves and get to work on making the future bright and green. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, for your statement. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations to address our meeting. Your Royal Highness Crown Prince of Denmark, Your Royal Highness Prince of Wales, Prime Minister Rasmussen, Minister Hedegaard, President of COP15, Mr. Dubois, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, <clears throat> let us pause to reflect on how far we have come to this defining moment in history. Many said that this day would never come. For years, <clears throat> skeptics called climate change a myth. The science has proved them wrong. Two years ago, 
they wrote off our efforts to launch a new climate negotiation. And yet, in Bali, you, we gave them a roadmap uh, to Copenhagen. As recently as a month ago, they again cast doubt. Copenhagen will fail, they said. The road is too hard, <clears throat> the difficulties too large. We are here today to write a different future. More than 130 heads of state and government have confirmed their presence in Copenhagen. That's a clear proof that climate change has risen to the top of the international agenda. Every day brings new commitments to our cause from industrialized countries, emerging economies, and developing countries alike. We know what we must do. <clears throat> we know what the world expects. Our job here and now is to seal a deal, a deal in our common interest, a deal that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, that protects the most vulnerable that ushers in a new era of clean development and green growth for all. Now is the time. For three years, I have sought to bring world leaders to the table to solve climate change. Now they are coming. Three years of efforts have come, come down to three days of negotiation and three days of action. Ladies and gentlemen, from my first day in office, I have spoken out about climate change. It is the defining challenge of our era. No issue is more fundamental to the global challenges we face, reducing poverty, maintaining economic growth, ensuring peace and stability. The evidence assaults us, melting ice caps, advancing desert deserts, rising sea levels. We have a chance, a real chance, here and now to change the course of our history. The momentum is there. We see it from all sectors of our society. Business people, civic leaders, religious leaders, and young people. Two months ago, I convened a summit meeting on climate change and the General Assembly in New York. Many of you were there. You will remember the young people from around the world reaching us at that time. Show us a change. They asked, show us leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to see a deal on climate change, to forge an agreement that all nations can embrace, an agreement that is fair, ambitious, and comprehensive, that acknowledges the demands of science that involves all countries working to limit global temperature rise to within two degrees, that charts a path for green growth and strengthens our ability to adapt to inevitable climate change. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what this means. Uh, first, more ambitious midterm mitigation targets from industrialized, industrialized countries. Uh, second, more action by developing countries to limit emission growth below business as usual. Third, an adaptation framework for all countries and fourth, financing and technology support. And fifth, transparent and equitable governance that gives all countries a voice. Financing will be the key, particularly in helping the poorest countries. That is why we can welcome the emerging consensus among developed countries to provide approximately $10 billion annually for the next three years to the Copenhagen Launch Fund. With this money, we can deliver real results, strengthen climate resilience, limit deforestation, jumpstart 
low emissions growth. But a fast start is just that, a start. $10 billion, annual, $10 billion annually will not solve all our problems. Here in Copenhagen, we must also address medium and long-term financing scaled up to needs. We cannot live here without an understanding of how we will proceed on this vital question. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, as I say, we have come a long way, a long way. Let us not falter in the home stretch. Our goal is to lay the foundation for a legally binding climate treaty as early as possible in 2010. We do not have another year to deliberate. Nature does not negotiate with us. I understand that every leader coming to Copenhagen faces domestic pressures and domestic politics. I also know that legitimate concerns of the most vulnerable remain. Ambition levels are not sufficient. But every citizen's well-being is at stake if we do not muster a truly global response now. The time for maximalist negotiating positions is over. The time for unreasonable demands and pressure on your negotiating partners is over. The time for consensus has arrived. No one will get everything they want in these negotiations. But if we work together and get a deal, everyone will get what they need. The stronger the agreement here in Copenhagen, the sooner it can be transformed into a legally binding treaty. Until we get such an agreement, the Kyoto Protocol remains the only, legal, only legal, legally binding instrument that captures reduction commitments. As such, it must be maintained. These talks in Copenhagen are among the most complex and ambitious ever to be undertaken by the world community. <clears throat> in sheer sweep and consequences, they are <clears throat> as momentous as the negotiations that created our great United Nations and built our modern era from the ashes of war more than 60 years ago. Once again, we are on the cusp of history. Once again, we are present at the opening of a new era. Our future begins today here in Copenhagen. Thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you, Secretary General, for your statement and for your presence here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming to the podium to address our meeting Her Excellency, Ms. Connie Hedegaard, President of the 15th Session of the Conference of the Parties and the 5th Session of the Conference of the Parties, serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellency, Ministers, Ladies and Gentlemen, in these very hours, success is still within reach. But as President of the COP, I must also warn you, we can fail. Probably without anyone really wanting it so, but because we spend too much time on repeating our positions, on sending signals, on formalities. If we are going to make it, and we are, because we must, well then, we must also change gears. We can't risk failure. No one here can carry that responsibility. That means 
that the key word for the next two days must be compromise. In the past year, people from all parts of the world, all walks of life, have raised their voice demanding action. From the poor farmers in Mali, suffering droughts and sudden showers, to Pacific Islanders already forced into exile, from Bengali women in cyclone shelters, to Inuits who can no longer trust the wisdom of their ancestors from union leaders to CEOs, from grassroots to heads of states, from scientists to leaders of faith, the call has been the same. Act, and act now, please. Hundreds of thousands have taken to the streets. Millions have signed petitions. Billions are out there worrying and waiting and expecting their leaders to agree on the answers to the challenge. This is my sixth cup. At each cup I've attended, I have listened to the talks, heard the many fine words, and basically never understood that the steps forward had to be that small. Much has changed over these last five years. And the fact that more than 120 heads of state and government are joining us here in Copenhagen is the best sign of that change. Now, climate has moved to the top of the international agenda. That is a fantastic and very important, important achievement. But now it is time to take big steps. That is the only way to overcome the seeming discrepancy between the call for action outside and the pace of progress here inside to make our work inside correspond with the expectations outside is what the next few days are all about. And in the next two days, we must take the decisions that we have been preparing for the last two years. Small steps must now be followed by big steps. Denmark has taken on the presidency in confidence of your cooperation. In the next days, we will do whatever is necessary to live up to the responsibility we have been given. We will do everything to live up to the trust you have shown us. But we can't do anything without you. You, the parties. You must compromise. You must commit. You must deliver now. And not only because of the climate. There is even more at stake. This is also about the world's confidence in their global leaders' will and ability to cope with the challenges of our time. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let's get it done. For years, disagreement has held us back. Now we must turn division into decision. And remember, we are all accountable, not only for what we do, also for what we fail to do. In the next three days, we have a unique chance. We can choose between fame and shame. We can favor action over stalemate. So, let's walk those last big steps. Let's get it done. Thank you, Madam President, for your statement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite to the podium the Executive Secretary of the Climate Change Secretariat, Mr. Ivo de Boer, to address our meeting. Your Royal Highnesses, Madam President, 
Honorable Heads of State, Honorable Prime Ministers, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. On this day to the day, two years ago, we were gathered in the closing plenary in Bali. After intense negotiations, you succeeded and adopted the Bali Roadmap. Here we are two years later. Now is the time to deliver. There has been some progress, but not enough to celebrate success. There has been some progress, but not nearly enough to present to the world as a success in Copenhagen. And we have almost run out of time. So we cannot continue to run over the same old ground. There is simply too much at stake. Compassion is what makes nations great. The aim here is not to celebrate the victory of one nation over another, of one group over another. The aim is to find solutions instead of letting problems continue. The aim is to celebrate a safer future. You all have the capabilities of creating such a future. That is why you are here. Science tells us that we have a window of opportunity in which we can still act, in which we still have a good chance of avoiding the worst consequences of climate change. The solutions exist. The will exists. The question is, will we, as humanity, rise to the occasion and seize the opportunity to agree to solutions. More than 150 world leaders will be here on Friday to adopt a strong agreement. They are not coming here to leave empty-handed. So, let the winds of change blow over the climate change negotiations. The world is waiting. Thousands of young people care about the outcome of this conference. I've received hundreds of paper footprints from children in Germany. I've received 1,000 folded paper butterflies from children in Australia. And I have received 350 drawings from children in the United States. They all want their future to be safer. One drawing captures what you as the leaders of the world need to do particularly well. It's a drawing by eight-year-old Sofia Dada. <coughs> Over the past two years, negotiators have made superhuman efforts to get us as far as they can. Now it is up to you to lead. We need ambitious results under the Kyoto Protocol. We need ambitious results under the Convention. Much of the groundwork has been laid for prompt implementation of action on mitigation, adaptation, technology cooperation, finance, red and capacity building. Much of the groundwork has been laid for ambitious emission reduction targets and mitigation actions. Much of the groundwork has been laid for far-reaching adaptation. And some progress has been made on finance and its governance. It is now up to you to resolve outstanding issues and to lead the world into action. It is up to you to ensure that the world initiates ambitious mitigation action and mobilizes the streams of funding needed to get action on adaptation, technology cooperation, red and capacity building. It is up to you to ensure that the road to Copenhagen will not be remembered as merely having been paved with good intentions. Rather, let the world remember Copenhagen as the place where good intentions were turned into good action, the place where it all started. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. De Boer, for your statement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome to the podium His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to address our meeting.
Prime Minister, Secretary General, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I am most grateful for your kind invitation to address this crucially important international gathering. We live in times of great consequence and therefore of great opportunity. With issues of such magnitude, it is easy to focus solely on the challenges, the worst case scenarios, the what ifs of failure. But take a moment to consider the opportunities if we succeed. Imagine a healthier, safer and more sustainable, economically robust world. Because if we share in that vision, we can share the will to action that is now required. Over more than three decades, I have been privileged to talk with some of the world's most eminent experts on uh, climate change and environmental issues, and to listen to uh, the wisdom of some of the world's uh, indigenous people. The conclusion I draw is that the future of mankind can be assured only if we rediscover ways in which to live as part of nature, not apart from her. For the grim reality is that our planet has reached a point of crisis and we have only seven years before we lose the levers of control. As the President of Gabon said at a meeting I hosted last month, the door to our future is closing. This, I fear, is not an overstatement, for climate change is a risk multiplier. It has the potential to take all the other critical issues we face as a global community and transform their severity into a cataclysm. Reducing poverty, increasing food production, combating terrorism, and sustaining economic development are all vital priorities. But it is increasingly clear how rapid climate change will make them even more difficult to address. Furthermore, because climate change is intimately connected with our systemic, uh, unsustainable consumption of natural resources, any decline in the ecological resilience of one resource base or ecosystem increases the fragility of the whole. To all appearances, we seem intent upon consuming the planet. It seems likely on current patterns of use that our global fisheries will collapse by 2050 and already fresh water is becoming scarcer, placing global food security at ever greater hazard. In the last 50 years, we have degraded 30% of global topsoil and destroyed 30% of the world's rainforests. All of these issues are linked to each other and to climate change, a truly vicious circle. And the climate crisis is the mirror in which we see reflected the combined ecological impact of our industrialized age. However, it is these links, together with our common humanity uh, and the unprecedented connections of today's global community, which might perhaps provide us with a, sol with a solution. Moreover, in our increasingly precarious situation on a small, unique and precious planet, this is not a problem resolvable in terms of them and us. For, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to uh, the air we breathe and the water we drink, there are no national boundaries. Uh, we all depend on each other and, crucially, on each other's actions for our weather, our food, our water and our energy. These are the tectonic plates on which the peace and stability of the international community rest. The Inescapable conclusion, therefore, is that a partial solution to climate change is, is no solution at all. It must be inclusive and it must be a comprehensive approach. 
one that strengthens the resilience of our ecosystems. Crucially, it must be embraced by the public, private and NGO sectors, as well as by local communities and indigenous people, while also encouraging individual responsibility. Now, one example that has been high on, on, on my agenda for the last two years is that of tropical rainforests. These ecosystems have been described as the planet's life belt, and with good reason. Not only uh, do they harbour about half of our terrestrial biodiversity and generate uh, much of the rainfall that is vital for farming, they also absorb and hold vast quantities of carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, as you know uh, far better than me, the forests are being cleared at a terrifying rate. The simple truth is with, that without a solution to tropical deforestation, there is no solution to climate change. And that is why I established a rainforest project to try to promote a consensus on how tropical deforestation might be significantly reduced. So in early April, I was able to host a meeting of heads of state and government at which it was agreed to establish an informal working group to look at this issue. As it turns out, it seems that the quickest and uh, most cost-effective way to buy time in the battle against catastrophic climate change is to find a way to, to make the trees worth more alive than dead. The project uh, has been exploring the drivers of deforestation and how innovative financing mechanisms could provide rainforest nations with financial rewards for positive performance. One example of such a performance-based approach is the recent most encouraging agreement between Guyana and Norway. The project is also working with the World Bank on an emergency package to stimulate private sector finance for rainforest nations. Ladies and gentlemen, I hardly need say that it is critical to find ways to prevent forests being converted to agriculture. And in this I have been heartened by my conversations with some of the world's largest agribusinesses which have told me that through more effective use of vast areas of degraded land, we could feed and fuel a growing population and keep the forests. But, ladies and gentlemen, it must be genuinely sustainable agriculture that helps to sequester carbon, protect biodiversity and empower local communities and small farmers. We thereby create a truly uh, virtuous, not a vicious circle and one because of its understanding of the relationship between agriculture and forestry that can only improve the lives of many of the poorest people on the planet while simultaneously benefiting nature. It also builds what seems to me to be the absolutely critical chain which links ecosystem resilience, adaptive capacity, poverty reduction and sustained economic development. This is the chain that we have broken and it is the chain that we must now remake. The need fully to engage the private sector reflects not only the growing uh, determination of business to act in a sustainable way, but crucially its uh, determination to listen to customers. And what customers are saying ever more loudly is that they want their investment choices to make a positive difference to climate change. One practical result of my work with the private sector on corporate social and environmental responsibility for the past 25 years is that growing numbers of pension funds have made a commitment to set climate solutions at the heart of their long-term investment decision-making. To ensure a large-scale deployment of capital, these pension funds need clear long-term policies to be agreed here this week. This request is supported by the 191 financial institutions with assets of over $13 trillion which signed the International Investor Statement on Climate Change. 
a further practical contribution is a statement by the international corporate leaders group of which i am patron comprising over nine hundred of the world's most prominent companies drawn from more than sixty three countries including all the g twenty members on the significant business opportunities which a robust effective and equitable global climate agreement could deliver. in helping to facilitate these initiatives my simple aim has been to show that we can all make a difference if we are determined to do so. above all i am convinced it is these kinds of global partnerships between government business ngos civil society and even individuals that will provide the global solutions needed to secure our future. subsequent inflows of private sector investment would do much to reinforce the credibility of all those particularly in the poorest countries who have had the courage to believe in the positive outcome of this meeting. several of their leaders while being only too aware of the immediate economic benefits of monetizing their country's natural capital have still chosen to follow the difficult path of turning their economies towards sustainable development. such visionary people have a vital role to play in helping the world to find the strength needed to address its problems. but ladies and gentlemen they desperately need our support for without it they may not have a second chance. surely now then is the time to recognize that we cannot have capitalism without nature's capital. we cannot sustain our human economy without sustaining nature's economy. now i know that so very many of you here today have been negotiating the unbelievably complex details of a potential agreement for a very very long time and you must be profoundly weary. but this is an historic moment. i can only appeal to you to listen to the cries of those who are already suffering from the impact of climate change. just as mankind had the power to push the world to the brink so too do we have the power to bring it back into balance. you have been called ladies and gentlemen to positions of responsibility at this critical time. the eyes of the world are upon you and it is no understatement to say that with your signatures you can write our future. and one final thought as our planet's life support system begins to fail and our very survival as a species is brought into question remember that our children and grandchildren will ask not what our generation said but what it did. so let us give an answer of which we can be proud. Thank you, Your Highness, for your presence here today and for your statement. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Wangari Matai, the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, to address our meeting. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Prime Ministers, Ministers, the Prime Minister of Denmark, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mrs. Ban Ki moon, the President of the COP15, Madame Connie Hedegaard, the Executive Secretary of the Convention, Ms. Ivo Debo, Honorable Delegates, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the people and the government of Denmark for the very warm hospitality that has been extended to us in the past few days. in the past the Green Belt movement has worked very closely 
with the people and civil society organizations in Denmark, both for the environment and, and development in general. Now, today, throughout the world, people's expectation is that in Copenhagen, delegates understand that while they cannot negotiate with the climate, they can negotiate with each other. The delegates understand the science and the predictions over, for example, the vulnerability of regions like Africa and small island states who are suffering from the negative impact of climate change even as delegates wrangle with the Kyoto Protocol and associated issues. The litany of wars have been repeated enough times in conferences and meetings as we prepared to come to Copenhagen. They including melting polar ice, permafrost and glaciers, deforestation, erratic and failed rains, prolonged droughts, drying rivers and lakes, parched landscapes, dying animals and large populations faced with diseases associated with malnutrition. It is not necessary to recite them here because we have all had them. We have also heard how there should be a historic responsibility for the emissions of greenhouse gases from regions with high energy consumption levels and how such regions have overused the common resources and atmospheric space. It is this understanding that has given rise to expectations for a historic carbon responsibility and carbon justice. We are generally agreed that emissions should be cut, but I know we are still arguing on how far the rich industrialized countries are willing to move away from their familiar comfort zones and cut emissions to levels that will save lives of the most vulnerable. As we have seen, as we have been informed by the scientific data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The rich countries have the technology and the capital to adapt and mitigate and thereby deal with many of the threats that will be facing the developing world. If the developed world do not feel sufficiently at risk, they may be unwilling to embrace an ambitious and legally, guiding, legally binding Kyoto Protocol-like agreement. Therefore, it is up to the developing world to convince them that the threat is real and it will face them too, despite their perceived invulnerability at the moment. Climate change is an issue of security, both locally and internationally. We are all in it together. Allow me to say that we may not come out of here with a perfect document. I've been attending UN meetings since 1976, that is ancient times. When I attended the Habitat Conference in Vancouver, Canada, Delegates there too argued and wrangled over languages and money. No delegate leaves the conference with a perfect document and a perfect financial mechanism to implement their dreams. And the Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change might not be any different. But what we must find is a common ground for partnership that is based on a willingness to be fair, to be trusting, to be honest, transparent, and responsible to ourselves and to millions who are following these discussions from home, 
indeed to generations not yet born. It would be essential to leave Copenhagen with a binding timetable and compliance measures in place, with a document that respects science, history and justice. Many of our leaders are here and continue to arrive. I have much confidence that we shall see leadership demonstrated with respect to Kyoto Protocol, adaptation, finance, Red Plus, capacity building and technology. Their high number is a reflection of their commitment to the expectations of the people of the world, and especially the most vulnerable. They will act. Excellencies, to achieve the goals, we need to overcome a legacy of mistrust that is born of a past era. There are several words that have been reverberating throughout this conference. They include words like transparency, honesty, accountability, fairness, rights, and responsibilities. Others I have heard at events organized by religious leaders. They included words like compassion, empathy, motainai, which encompasses respect, gratitude, and not wasting resources. These values, more than science and figures, might be the basis for a true human partnership among the leaders to achieve the ultimate objectives of this convention. At this point, I want to take a moment to thank groups and individuals who have already demonstrated much commitment. They include the heads of states of Central African region, who appointed me to be Goodwill Ambassador for the Congo Forest. Also, the British and the Norwegian governments, through their respective Prime Ministers, Prime Minister Gordon Brown and Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg. Each of these governments made available one U, uh, 100 million US dollars with which we established the Congo Forest Fund as a global response to the climate crisis. The Right Honorable Paul Martin, the former Prime Minister of Canada and I, were asked to chair this fund and we deposited the money in the African Development Bank under the able leadership of Mr. Donald Kaberuka. After Copenhagen, we hope that more partners will come forward to support such funds. Such partnership has already been established between the fund and the Prince Albert II Foundation. We, it is with such commitments that I'm hoping that forest will be an integral part of the solutions that come from Copenhagen. In committing to Red Plus, we support restoration, conservation and protection, not only of the forest's ecosystem for the role they, they play as carbon sinks, but also for all the other environmental services they give to us human beings and all other forms of life. From Copenhagen, we need a governance structure based on accountability between donors and the beneficiaries and a consolidated UN financial mechanism that can make resources available and accessible to those who need them most as soon as possible. For the African region, for example, and other regions that are considered in, uh, lacking capacity, it is very important that we allow established institutions to play their role. Distinguished delegates, there is an orb at the end of the long table. This orb contains stories, voices, images, and actions collected from around the world to create a global mandate for action. It is the symbol of the collective spirit which brings together the efforts of all major climate campaigns from the civil society this year. The orb will also have a space reserved on it on its drive for one final but significant document on how nations will deal with the climate change. Here at Copenhagen, we have a unique chance to challenge ourselves and give the world more than hope. And that is, as we have said all along, that we need an ambitious, a fair, 
and the legally binding agreement. Before I conclude, uh, allow me to thank the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who has designated me as a UN messenger of peace with a focus on environment and climate change. And in that spirit, may peace and justice prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matai, for your statement. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the opening ceremony on the occasion of the high-level segment of the 15th session of the Conference of the Parties and the fifth session of the Conference of the Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol. Please join me in thanking our honored guests for their presence here today. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, may I please ask you to kindly remain in your seats in order to allow our distinguished guests, the Executive Secretary, and the President of the Conference to take their leave. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>